Okay, good. No, I, I hope the, the talk that we're ha going to have today uh, convinces this last group of people that this might not be the best decision for Ethereum and that it's actually not that hard to take cards into your own matter and to actually start doing it yourself. So yeah, let's go for it. Um, this is what Vitalik published not that long ago, and this is the roadmap of Ethereum. And... Solo stakers are people that are not professional stakers. They're not professional validators. They're people that have their own jobs. They're people that might or might not have children. They might have hobbies. They might have other things to do than just keeping up with this. So how the heck are they supposed to keep up with all of this? And that's the purpose of this talk. We're going to try to lay down in the next 25 minutes um, the next things that are going to be huge and that are going to impact us all as solo stakers and that we need to take into account um, and how to react with it. So first of all, um, let's to try to convince these people that are still staking with Kraken. Um, okay, so it is vital that there are more solo stakers. The reason of this talk is because we need to convince you that you can stake and that is actually worth it. It is vital, it is vital for Ethereum and it's actually an existential threat to Ethereum if we don't have enough solo stakers. So we all have seen this. Um, we all have seen how a very few entities control a huge majority of the, uh, of the validators. Um, who here remembers the Steam fiasco? The blockchain <laughs> Steam fiasco? Right, so actually <laughs> having centralized validators or centrali centralized um, with it actually can, can do things like we're ju just in some, the Steam fiasco was just in Sun bought Steamit, which was a company that was behind the blockchain Steam. And there were some people that, were, that did not agree with him. So he basically went to Poloniex and a few other exchanges and said, like, hey, gra hey guys, take this couple milli and we're going to vote for an invalid state transaction when the accounts of these opponents of mine are going to be emptied from one block to another. Imagine your Ethereum accounts emptied like this, invalid state transaction. This is what happens when we got centralized validators. So yes, it is dangerous, okay? But not only this, there's even a, a more insidious thing that's happening in, in Ethereum right now. Right now, we have compliant <laughs> block production. Through things like MEV Boost, we have a 32% of the blocks being produced in Ethereum right now a 32% of blocks produced that are OFAC compliant. That means that if you have ever used Tornado Cash, there's a 32% of the blocks where your transactions are not going in. Did you know that? Did you know that you're being censored in 32% of the blocks? This is huge. And this is MEV Boost. And if we go into the MEV Boost produced blocks, this is 87% are come from relayers that have said that they are going to comply with OFAC. This is why it's so important, right? Okay, so brief, uh, brief introduction to Dabnode. Dabnode, we're here to make it easy. We're here to make it easier for people to uh, run nodes. We provide a UI. You don't even need to be technical. There's auto updates, so you don't need to like te do the testing. We test for you, and then we push the update, and it will be updated. This saves about 72 hours of DevOps, the, of DevOps work per year, only on Geth and Prism, for example. Um, then there's like all sorts of nice, beautiful things, like a Web3 signer that holds the keys for you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a huge community of thousands of validators um, that are doing exact, the exact same thing as you, and where you can just uh, lay, rely on them, uh, ask for support, etc. This is one of the things that we have done. Um, this is what you need. This is what you see. This is the UI that you will use in order to set up a validator. You need to choose your execution client, choose your consensus client, uh, put the keys into the remote uh, signer, or use optionally MEB boost. Okay, enough. The thing that a solo staker needs to know is that you are the key for the future of Ethereum. All right, MEV. Uh, okay, so MEV. Uh, MEV stands for maximal extractable value. And the first thing that we need to know here is that the value is extracted from who? From the user. 
And people say like, oh, MEV, um, but they're doing nice things. They do arbitrage between DEXs, so we can <coughs> like, if I have a token, my price will be the same everywhere. Yeah, that's a good thing, right? But how about everything else? You got price execution in every trade that you do in a DEX. You got gas wars and network congestion whenever there's like a juicy MEV opportunity. You get the potential and the threat of chain reorgs if there's something really juicy and the conditions are right. And the validators are incentivized to attack themselves. So if I come after uh, the, a block where there's a really juicy MEV opportunity, I'm incentivized to screw up the guy that comes before me so I can keep the MEV opportunity, right? Okay. So yes, uh, how to map all of this related to MEV? So mainly for me and for most of us, MEV is not a feature, it's a bug. It has a lot of implications on the Ethereum design because of that, because it's something that is leading in, a, in the wrong direction. So mainly PBS has formed to try to mit mitigate this situation. PBS uh, proposed a block separation, and we are going to talk about that uh, later on. Uh, so that is why the concern of the community and the researcher to try to mitigate as much as we can the MEV. Uh, and that is why we are starting to see new uh, proposals like single slot finality. Uh, single slot finality is a proposal to be able to have finality in just one uh, epoch. Uh, and the idea is to, to remove these opportunities from, from the protocol itself. But also the single uh, secret ele leader elec election that is related to the vali validator anonymity is something that is also uh, researching right now and we are talking later on. So mainly we are seeing how the Ethereum Foundation is trying to find uh, ways to mitigate this situation at a protocol level. But there are some things that we cannot mitigate. So far uh, we have seen that it's really, really hard to find a solution to MEV. So that is why uh, the PBS or MEV smoothing is a way to make this uh, more fair and try to mitigate the situation. All right, so what do you need to know for MEV? So, go ahead. So yeah, so yeah. MEV, <laughs> MEV is a centralizing force. It's a centralizing force um, because uh, MEV res researchers will not give you as a solo staker a juicy 10 million MEV opportunity because you as a solo staker that has only 42,000, uh, 32 ETH in this, uh, uh, in your validator, you would be, you would be happy to take this 10 million, shut down your validator and go live in the Bahamas for the rest of your life. So it is a trustful system. And as a solo staker, you cannot access MEV opportunities if you don't use MEV boost right now in the future. PBS provides the same separation of powers and allows for easier builder um, decentralization and removes the need to trust the, the builder of the block. But right now, MEV is a huge centralizing force um, that, uh, that, yeah, that, that basically um, uh, ha makes that us as solo stakers will only have um, two sources of revenue, which are block production, so block reward and transaction fees. And the big companies, the big trusted companies that can sign agreements would have those two plus MEV opportunities. So MEV boost is for now, as solo stakers, the only solution that we have to access this, um, uh, this revenue. Yeah, and mainly the feeling that we are having with MEV is that we are putting the incentivization in the ground place. We are incentivizing incentivate people to extract this value from users. So that is why we should try to find a way to remove this from the protocol. Okay, DVT. DVT is the next hot topic and it's distributed validators. So right now there's, uh, there's this equality of uh, one validator key, one validator client, which basically means that whoever runs the machine, whoever runs the validator client also has access to that key and can do all sorts of bad things to this. It can, it can slash you, it can ransom you, um, it can just exit you, it can just uh, shut the validator down so you get uh, inactivity leak. Um, and DVT comes in, so the, <laughs> the DVT comes in, um, so you can split the validator key in different key shares uh, and distribute it over many validator clients. This allows for high availability, but because imagine these validator shares as a sort of like a multi-sig. So if three of these shares are online out of four, so if one of them are offline, we can still continue validating. 
It also allows for different trust assumptions um, because you can distribute these shares. So no, nobody with, with one of these shares, you can't do all, you can't slash people. You can't uh, exit. You can't do all of this stuff. So actually, we do not require so much. We, we can afford to give these keys to other people and not require so much collateral. Right now, Rocket Pool still requires a, somebody to put 16 ETH, huge amount of collateral, because that's what they can get from, uh, that's how much damage they can do. So um, with DVT, we get a different trust assumption and uh, the potential for lower collateral requirements. Moreover, um, those who run, already run nodes and already have a, a validator set up, they can monetize through DVT technologies on top of their validator sets. So it's a way to bump up your, um, your, your rewards for having a, a validator. Okay, so exactly that's, that's exactly what you need to know about DVT. You'll be able to monetize your machine by leveraging other protocols on top of it. These protocols are like SSV Network or Obol or Diva, and that people will be able to participate in validation even with less than 32 ETH because you can do a setup and then you can participate in this, which is great for accessibility because we're making part of the benefits of running infrastructure to people that, do not, that are not rich, to people that do not have 32 ETH. So it's great for accessibility. All right, withdrawals. Yep. Withdrawals, withdrawals, that's what all, all we're waiting for, right? Like we've got this 32 ETH withdrawals are going to be a new system level operation, which will have no gas cost, and it will, they will not even go to the EVM. They will, they will increase the, uh, the balance uh, of the withdrawal address automatically. Um, it'll be a limited block per block, just like right now um, joining as a validator is also limited block per block. There's a limited amount of, uh, of uh, people that can join the validator set. The same thing will happen with withdrawals. And what we need to know is that we will be able to get our money if we want to. Now, there's something more interesting to think about here, which is what will happen when people are able to take this? Will um, staking pools be, uh, will people take out of staking pools and start solo staking? That's what we're hoping. Or will the opposite happen? So what's going to make it easier to convince people to take out of staking pools and centralized exchanges and, um, and start running? And so running it themselves. Yeah. All right. So yeah, now it's time to talk about prototype sharding and the future of, of Ethereum. So mainly uh, the, the roadmap of Ethereum changed uh, completely at the moment that Vitalik make this uh, Reddit post. So uh, mainly we realized that if we facilitate rollouts, they have better scalability and potential than the previous execution shards. So mainly everything changed at that moment. We forget about having execution on the shards, and we move to a way to provide data availability for other layer two applications that are going to happen during these years. Um, so mainly, mainly the thing that happened with uh, product and sharding is that uh, in the, instead of providing more space for transactions, we are, more, we are going to provide more space for data that the uh, layer two solutions can use it in the future. So the idea is mainly that the execution is going to happen on these uh, CKVMs and rollups, uh, keeping the, the execution part of Ethereum as it is. Um, and mainly from the point of view of validator, um, is just um, um, a way to validate the data that is available. So it's not going to the include the need of um, validate this, this data as in the state of Ethereum. Um, so yeah, what do you, what you need to know about this? Um, mainly the Bitcoin ch chain is going to store these new blocks and um, the, the data is going to be store, uh, it's going to be used by the rollups. So mainly the idea is that um, you get a Berkle tree, a proof of this data, and you can use a precompiled smart contract in Ethereum that validates this data, allowing them to verif verify the state of these uh, layer two solutions. Um, yeah, mainly, mainly the idea behind this is like a solution like the CKVM, uh, like a Polygon announced yesterday, that uh, are going to be able to have a proof of the state and take the security of Ethereum inside this layer two solutions. So mainly Ethereum is trying to provide these new tools for these kind of solutions, making the scalability going in that direction. So what do we need to know? We need to know that those blobs, those new blobs of data will be stored in the beacon chain. 
which will mean that our beacon chains as validators, total stakers, will grow, will bloat. But, hey, it will not grow indefinitely because this data will only be stored for about a month. So that's great. So we'll have the, our beacon chains will not just continuously grow and grow and grow, at least the part of the blobs, but every month um, we will we'll be deleting this data. So it will grow, but it will now grow indefinitely. All right. Yeah. Next big topic. Anonymity. Yeah, that's also a critical point of, of the network. So yeah, the thing is, since we are using random in the beacon chain to select the validator proposals, it's possible to know beforehand who is going to be the next one. And since we are using the EP2B network to uh, communicate with these nodes, it's also possible to get the IP of the nodes. So mainly the thing is that uh, since we have also MIF in this situation, um, people want or could try to attack these nodes because they can get the minor extraction value or the maximal extraction value from the block. So at the end, it's the, the same problem that before. We are putting the incentivation to attack the network. So we are making, um, yeah, right incentivations for, for the, the solo stakers. Um, but this is not just that. The thing is, um, the secret, uh, single secret leader election is a protocol that is going to allow to hide who is going to do, be the next proposal. Uh, and with that, you can protect this kind of attacks. And this is something that is already in the blockchain, in the protocol, and it's obviously very important to protect the privacy of the validators. So what you, what you need to know about this? Um, yeah, because the list of proposers of the new epoch are now, it's possible to be uh, targeted by these attackers. Uh, this new protocol protects the privacy of the validators at the moment uh, to propose the, blo the block, but we need also new ways to hide the communication between nodes because the IP is still exposed. So that is why private solutions like Hopper or other can provide this kind of uh, privacy protection at IP level. Right, next hot topic, statelessness and PBS. Yeah, a good one. So yeah, this, is, ha, this has been a hot topic uh, in the uh, research part of the protocol from uh, several years ago. So mainly the thing that uh, we have now, right now is that we need to have all the state of execution client to be, able to, be, to be able to verify the next block. So this is a problem because we are taking all the complexity, all the historical data uh, from the Ethereum and we are, um, need to store this in, in our devices to be a solo stakers. So mainly the, the proposal is to try to remove this complexity uh, with the idea to be able to verify a block without the need of having all the state. So the big idea is just to have a witness of the state at that, at that moment. Uh, and if you have this proof and this witness, you can validate that the transition from one state to the another one is, is correct. So mainly, the good part of this is that we can remove all the state of Ethereum and just to have a, a, a very small proof of the current state and be able to verify uh, a block. So, Edu, you're telling me that with, if we create a block through this, um, so through this witness and through this proof, we can prove the p only the parts of the state that we need to prove that this block is valid and include it in the block itself. So. A validator of the block will be able to look at the block in itself and be able, it, and it'll include this proof, so it'll be able to tell if it's valid or not. Yeah, exactly. Which so means, yeah. which means that we need to link this with. Okay, so we're need, we're starting to separate who does all of this uh, proof production exactly. and who does the validator work. So, PBS. Yeah, PBS. PBS is going to be also a very important part of the protocol. Uh, because the, the thing that uh, Paul just mentioned. So mainly the idea is that we are going to split the roles on the network. We are going to have proposal and, uh, and uh, block producers. So mainly the idea is that the uh, block producer is the one that is going to create all of these to generate the witness and, and is the one that is going to take this uh, high computation. Um, uh, <laughs> we don't have too much time, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, the idea is just to put all this computation in the block producers and the validators are going to be uh, more or less the same. So they only need to validate this proof in a short, short way. 
So, what do we need to know? Yeah, mainly, mainly that, that the hardware requirement for holding the state disappears, and that is really, really good. And also, if we link with the blob things, it's like, oh, okay, we are getting more space here, and we are putting blocks there, so more or less we are going to be the same. Uh, it's going to increase the bandwidth, uh, but not too much, because we are going to move for, from producer medical trees to vertical trees that are uh, more efficient ways to prove the state. Uh, so mainly as a validator, I think uh, the result is going to be more or less the same. Uh, it's has been always um, a need that uh, validators need to be running uh, custom hardware, so we keep on that level. Okay, I'm going to take the dank, sh the dank sharding and data availability sampling. Um, okay, so this is going to be the last thing and the key part to, that solo stakers need to know right now about this is that we do not know which are the consequences that it will have. So we cannot possibly know right now because there's not a specific implementation of the data availability sampling. So data availability sampling, what it will allow us is to remember those blobs of data that we have mentioned before. So these blobs of data will not necessarily be uh, fully downloaded. We could, we'll be able to just prove a sample of this, to take a sample of this data and prove somehow that, um, that this exists and this is valid and available for download. But we do not know yet what's going to be for solo stakers because there's too many, there's too many moving pieces and this is way too far away. So for the moment, for solo stakers, what it matters is the proto dank sharding, the existence of these data blobs, etc. So, to summarize very, very quickly, on the topics that we have spoken, MEV, it's a bug, not a feature. It's a centralizing force and it screws up our, center, our censorship resistance. For DBT, we will be able to leverage our setups to earn extra rewards. For the withdrawals, pretty self-explanatory, we'll be able to take our deposits out. Protodank sharding, our consensus layer will grow with these blobs of data. Validator anonymity. A single secret leader election will save us from the MEV extractors that come behind us and they want to get us offline to get the MEV opportunities. Statelessness is that we will have less, uh, less drive requirements, but we will have more bandwidth and dunk sharding that we don't really know. So in 25 minutes, this is everything you needed to know about the next phase of Ethereum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.